Hello and welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. And my guest today is Norm Young. Welcome back, Norm. It's been a while since we did one. I feel like it's been months since I've talked it, to you last. It has been. Uh, well, a little while. Uh, it, Norm is, of course, a Microsoft MVP and a senior strategic consultant at AvPoint. So welcome. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm thinking, where did we see each other? Was it the last time? Well, we saw each other at the M365 Community Conference. That's right. That does seem like a very long time ago. But um, it does. When was was that? April? Was that May? June? I I don't know. Long enough that I've forgotten. But what I will tell you is, I had never been to that event before. Um, And for me, it was a uh, a culmination of a lot of years of being a uh, Microsoft MVP, being in the community, being uh, someone who was keen to learn more from other like-minded individuals. And M365 was, you know, on my bucket list to go to. And I was lucky enough to go. Uh, it was great seeing you and some other community friends. Uh, had the opportunity to give a talk about Microsoft List and, and Power Automate, two of my favorite subjects. And uh, that was all done in what, Orlando, beautiful, beautiful Orlando, and the weather was quite nice that time of year. And uh, it wasn't too hot; it was all right. I did complain. I made the mistake on the last day before leaving, like, and I was walking around outside of wearing the black T-shirt. That was yeah. a mistake. It was the warmest on that last day, but it wasn't one of those overpowering humidity things. As a Western U.S. guy, like, I, I don't like the humidity thing. Yeah. How do people live in that? I, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Dry heat, people. Dry heat, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I, I didn't have co-pilot or AI fatigue at the, at the end of that event. Like It I, was a good balance. It was yeah. a good balance. I, I, of course, I was in the expo hall the entire time and doing community stuff. Uh, so I, I, I wasn't in the sessions. Uh, but I, you know, I, I got that sense from people that, it was a good balance and that they, the other thing that they did, and it was an intentional move and other conferences should pay attention to this, is they didn't front load all of the advanced topics on new stuff on the first day. Mm. And instead they spread the things out and allowed people to go to the the the, the more fundamental courses of the, yeah. the other the sessions and other things and kind of more plot out their their schedule to learn about something and go to advanced topics. So, I, yeah, anyway, yeah. that again, that was an intentional move that I wish more events did. Yeah, but, indeed. It was, uh, yeah, it was a privilege to be a part of that conference. It was great to see everyone. Uh, it was nice to come out of it, being a little more motivated to, to learn more about some of the new technologies or some of the more cornerstone ones like SharePoint and, and Teams. And of course, those those everyday tools that we use and we build our, our, our solutions on, whether they're collaborative or or, or uh, even, uh, you know, more power platform based where these types of things tend to touch everything. So it was nice to, to get that motivation coming out of it and not being just overwhelmed with the, the marketing and the, the hype that goes along with all of these new announcements. So yeah, it was good. It's a, I, that's another thing where it's a skill that you have to develop, like a muscle. You have to build the muscle, which is to uh, hear the marketing content, the announcements, the things that are out there, and be able to d- discern from those what's actually real and available today on my tenant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What could I actually, what could I actually use? What can I leverage? And I do appreciate too from community speakers, not as much from Microsoft speakers, but from community speakers who are sensitive to that and talk about differences between versions. And this, of course, was especially true when there was still a lot of on-prem. There's still a lot of (laughs) on-prem solutions around. Um, But, you know, they go in and talk about, well, this capability, these features are only available in these versions, and this is what you need to have. That that's a, a it's a must have in any presentation to talk about 
what licenses you need, who this is relevant for. Um, otherwise, you get people, and this is a problem with uh, with Viva marketing, was that a lot of people like got excited, and then it was very complex of what licenses you need for the features, the things that you saw. Right. And it's we're um, not going to solve that problem, though. No, <laughs> no, no, and, and nor do I even want to attempt it. Um, yeah, it's 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 striking that balance of knowing new what's new, what's important in the new to help uh, you know bring our, our our customers value and not have them with a roadmap that says you have to get everything that's new every six months or every 12 months, whatever the release cycle is. It's just like, that's not realistic. And it's like Copilot. Uh, Copilot has been uh, a, a nonstop uh, wave uh, of information coming out and, you know, whether it's preparing for Copilot or licensing for Copilot or the top 20 things you must use Copilot for, it's, it's one of those things where I still find myself uh, Finding, sifting through all this information, news, to find out where the the right placement of the value of the value of, of the promise of Copilot, excuse me, will be in my my day to day working life, and then extrapolating that out for the the teams I'm on, uh, extrapolating that out even further to the organization I'm in, and then of course you transpose those lessons learned to the customers that you might have, and you're trying to give them the uh, the digestible uh, view of how to place and position co-pilot measure adoption, all those types of things. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's one of the differences have, have been historically. You know, Microsoft, of course, um, I mean, when they're investing heavily in these conferences. So they're these community conferences, which are in, like you've got the Power Platform uh, Community Conference that's coming up in September down in Las Vegas. We just had the N365 one that was in Orlando. Um, they also have the uh, Fabric conference, which they launched in the first one. I mean, for the first time conference, they had 4,500 attendees, and it was a great first wow. conference for that. So that's only going to grow. So those three conferences. And of course, you have like the uh, uh, you know, TechCon 365, the PowerCon, um, which are smaller, but uh, are one of my favorite, very community focused events. And that's in Seattle, mm. DC in DC, Seattle just happened, DC in August and Dallas in November. Um, like I'm not planning to do the DC one. Um, I've got family stuff in August, but I will be in Dallas in November, for example. But anyway, my point is that those conferences, when you look at the mix of the Microsoft speakers coming in, the product teams that support those events, Obviously, they want to talk about the new, new, new stuff. The benefit of those events, I feel, is more with the practitioners, with the community experts out there, because you get a better sense of, and we're about to dig into this with what we're talking about today, uh, Work Trend Index um, study, uh, is that you get a better sense of what, what are the practical applications of this technology? What are the real world scenarios? These are people that are deploying this technology, large customers, small customers. Uh, what are they actually seeing? How are people actually leveraging and using Copilot and Power Platform in the real world? And how are they handling my, my topic of governance? How are they managing all of those things, making sure that they remain secure and compliant and well governed and operational um like all of those things you get a better sense of that from the community content than you do from microsoft content right so uh, well let me just share this out this is our primary topic today we're going to dig into some of what we just talked about and why we feel that way and let me share this and this and there we go so if you are uh, have not yet seen this. Of course, it was a blog post out May 8th by Jared Spataro. Jared is an awesome human being, CVP of AI at work. Um, if, if anybody's had a chance, like Jared is a fantastic presenter. He had uh, got to know him personally um, when he, for a year, year and a half, two years, two years, I think, ran the SharePoint organization, um, ran the, like the, the, the product team. And I think that was when Jeff Teeper 
stepped away and went over to the um, went over to M12 to the VC side of the business for Microsoft, but then came back, uh, took it back over. Um, but uh, Jared talks a lot about um, you know all the, the AI and what's what's happening, and of course promoting that and does a great job. Uh, announced here that Microsoft and LinkedIn released a 2024 work trend index on the state of AI at work. And we're gonna go through that. If you've not seen this, one, I'd always recommend, make sure you bookmark the Work Lab site. It is an awesome website. And this was launched a couple of, you can see, leadership, culture, innovation, collaboration, performance, well-being. This is the site Microsoft launched. I'm a huge advocate for this site because it, Microsoft uses this to go in depth and talk about why they're building certain things, why they're following the path. Like when the AI stuff and Copilot was announced and all that, you could find a lot of discussion content around ethical use of AI and what how Microsoft looks at it. It's so it's it's fantastic. It's also where they host, as you can see here on the screen, the Work Trend Index report. And then they go in and analyze that. They, you can see right here, they make it easy to consume, explore the findings, talk about each of these things, scroll down through the, the, the data, they pull out their stats and share those things. So with that announcement, I'm gonna talk about some of the highlights here. And I'll of course have the links uh, in the blog and out on YouTube. Here's my first thought on this, Norm. I wanna get your thoughts too, is that, because uh, we were talking before we started recording about our actual usage of, of Copilot. My perception of this is I talk to, uh, it's not exaggerated, say hundreds of customers through these conferences over the last year, year and a half, talking about Copilot is I, just about everybody I talk to that is doing something with Copilot is piloting something with Copilot. Very few, probably that of those that I've talked to count on one hand that actually have it in production. Yeah. And so while I love getting this data and the early insights, my feeling is that we're still way too early on actual data around a sizable number of customers to truly understand how it fits in, how it benefits, where it fits. I what agree with that. I agree with the, the, the sample of your, your the customers that you've been dealing with. It's similar to what I'm experiencing as well. Organizations may have bought a lot of licenses, but they're incrementally rolling them out in this pilot phase to understand what the risk is and the risk mitigation of not having their environment co-pilot ready. And also to start quantifying the value of the, the license expenditure. This is this is no longer about, yeah, let's let's have teams and we get people chatting or or storing files in a central location or having a meeting. It's way past that. It's to really people are really taking a close look at the value realization out of this. I see people seeing if there's like new ways of working as a result of this. Are they uh, starting to get the breadth and depth of all the co-pilot applications in that license? And, and so people are taking a, a very hard look at that. And that's what I'm seeing as well. And they also want to know uh, how they can take those pilot programs and take any learnings from it and apply them to other areas. And I guess what I'm trying to say is, uh, they don't want people to reinvent how to use the technology over and over again, because then you're like, you're reinvesting with every new group or phase of that rollout. And it's something like a spreadsheet. It's more expensive, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, it, it's, it's, a, it's it, the, the accrual of the, the investment just keeps going up. Whereas like, when you moved Excel or Word or email from on-premise to the cloud, you were already had the, the skills to get by to do the basic functionality. It was just adding the value that you of lessons or information, whatever you want to call it, to, to the users. So it was it was an incremental expense. It wasn't that gave you a higher return moving to the cloud versus all those on-prem apps that I was talking about. But Copilot is different. You and I can use Copilot in different ways. 
and get different value, but it may not be in line with what the organization is expecting. So, yeah, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. I think that's why I am, I, I mean, I, I, I've been saying this for like all year is that I was looking forward to the fact that, you know, Microsoft Ignite, so the conference in November, this is, uh, again, people that are newer to the Microsoft ecosystem, Microsoft has, historically had their three marquee events that are their events you have the build early in the year which is the developer conference inspire which has traditionally been in july um, which is the business formerly the worldwide partner conference uh, then ignite in the fall which is the it pro admin traditionally mm -hmm. they're um they're combining inspire and ignite uh for chicago in november um, but they're expecting, I've heard, heard initially that 10 to 12,000 that now that now they're saying they could expand up to like 20,000 attendees, but it's going back. They've done the hybrid version. Um, and I would say not been successful. Um, the marketers at Microsoft think it's a huge success. Look at all the registrations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For the community, for the partners, it's been a terrible model. So it's, I'm excited to see it get back to an in-person larger format. But that event has traditionally been where you start seeing then those real world scenarios. Here's yep. what we're actually seeing, those examples and the, the community discussions and the partner discussions around the technology. So I'm still hopeful that we will start seeing some of those kinds of sessions uh, and get more practical experience, real world experience from the community out of those events. In the meantime, I mean, I, and I'm, I don't want to undercut what Microsoft has done with their initial pilots and the companies that, mm -hmm. that you know, were initially adopted. You have to remember, though, they were very selective of who they led into those early pilots. And these are people that were at the forefront, you know, wanted to get in there and, and really explore. They were bought in and working closely with Microsoft already around those. Uh, and so I, I, that's why I discount a lot of the stats that came out of the early system. Right. I was like, you know, again, I don't want to beat up on them. It's, I'm not trying to say that they're, it's false information, but any survey is skewed, has biases towards their sample size and sample, sure. uh, you know, uh, um, demographic, psychographic sure. Sure. cut of the audience that participates in it. So yeah. you just and have to, you know how, you have to know how to read the data to understand. Indeed. And one of the things that I'm, I continue to wonder about Copilot specifically with Microsoft is I have not had the, the full working experience day-to-day -day co-pilot across all of my applications i have it in some but it's you know it's kind of a, a restricted release on my home org and i don't use it enough in my personal tenant to get the full value out of it so i keep thinking to myself microsoft must know the real value the real benefit to these applications because they're developing it they're using it every day and i'm just waiting for them to like lead me down that trail to where it is because right now it kind of feels like trust us this is a big deal and I'm like, no, hey, I trust you. I see some value in it when I'm working inside of Word or I'm getting a Teams meeting recap. Like those things are awesome for me. But I'm still like, is that enough for an organization, you know, very large organization to invest half a million dollars in licensing? Are they going to get that, that return on investment? Uh, and so I also, the other, the other thing that comes to mind whenever I think about this is, you know, one of the first things that started bubbling up uh, inside of like GitHub where all of the, and from Microsoft, they're developing all of these uh, prompt libraries. Mm -hmm. So someone who generated a, or created a good response that had a, a, a business outcome or, or some type of technical outcome that they're looking for to capture it and store it and then have other people manually use it. And I was, I was like, okay, I guess that's good. But like, really, do we, we have to have like a, a high tech post it note to get the value out of this and scale it across an organization. Kind of defeats the purpose of 
what they're the way that they're selling it if you're having to go and i mean it's like it, it it's like people that are powershell and you know scripting yes. experts that are out there it's fantastic incredibly powerful but it quickly becomes so complex to get that thing well it's like well that kind of defeats the purpose of mm -hmm. for the copilot world you know uh, of i want something that i can use natural language and go and be able to dig into my data yeah. Yeah, so I'm like, are, are they, are you, are you bringing productivity to the masses, or are you just bringing another productivity tool to the masses? And and I'm not trying to, you know, uh, throw shade at Microsoft, but until organizations and and the the tools reach a level of maturity to find the right way of leveraging it, I just I see myself having to reinvent a wheel that the person beside me probably has already invented. And so I don't like that. I don't like that you have to, uh, you can't repurpose as much of those prompts and some of those those learnings in the current state. Yeah. And well, nothing is stopping. No one is going to slow it down either. No. And, and in fact, uh, and I think what, uh, the last tab here, when we get over to, uh, you know, the the how it's being extended and, and other things that are coming out, uh, I think it goes into the argument of more specific, it makes it, I think, a lot more focused um, for the business scenarios that you have. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll come to that. So here's some of the data points that they pulled out. So this is again from Jared's uh, blog post, you know, employees want AI at work and they won't wait for companies to catch up. So that is true. And this is actually, and like when you brought up the cost, like I agree. I mean, for the things that I'm using, so I have Copilot, I went out and paid for it. As soon as Microsoft, re, uh, you know, removed the threshold for, for SMBs, you know, you it, initially when they launched it, Copilot, you had to have 300 minimum seats at yeah. 30 bucks a month, a user for a year. And they removed that threshold. So me with my one user, me, I went and paid, you know, basically 400 bucks after tax, whatever it was, uh, and bought it. And then of course, a month later, they gave it to all the MVPs, gave us a free license. So I have two licenses now, yep. uh, but went and deployed it. Here's where I use it daily. I use it in Teams. I use it to summarize in, uh, in Exchange. What do I use it in Teams? It's to summarize conversation, to find and track tasks that may have been assigned, to ask questions around the data for it to go look through you know, the, the, the meetings, the recordings, all those kinds of things. Ex, uh, if on the exchange side, an email to be able to go in and, uh, and, and pull in insights from them. What do I actually need to go and do? What's urgent, truly right. urgent around right. them? And what are those things? What did I forget in the last week that I need to go follow up on? Um, I, I use it in PowerPoint because I hate PowerPoint. <laughs> and so to have better um, designer capabilities is fantastic. And then I use it, I probably use it the most uh, is in the browser, Edge browser, um, because it has the latest chat GPT version in it, and it's able to look at my data as well as my profile, as well as out on the web, that version of it. So for me, and this is, we talk about the cost of that. For me, I believe there's enough value that I get out of that price point that I will continue using it and paying for it as a, as a single user on my own tenant. But I'm also paying for other premium AI tools and services. Yep. I am a chat GPT premium user as well. Uh, and we get it. That's a different discussion of why Copilot or Edge, you know, the, with the mm -hmm. relationship with Microsoft versus chat GPT. Because I have found that the results are faster and better through ChatGPT Direct for what the way that I work and the way that I use it. Yeah. So again, that that's a conversation for another day. But for sure. employees, of course, are not waiting around for this. Um, no. You know, we're seeing you know the how it's starting to impact the job market. I think uh, you know this is like when there was the discussion, but this is on steroids. Is even more serious about moving to the cloud. People were concerned about what is going to happen with their jobs. And it is starting to evolve a number of roles. At, as a marketing guy, I mean, I see it as a fantastic tool. It's 
where I use it for most of the stuff. It gets rid of the tedious aspects of digital marketing, being able to go and quickly summarize, reword, clean up, mm -hmm. sure. um, give me A, B versions of this copy. Here's the intent. Here's the audience. Tailor it for these industries. I mean, it's fantastic. Uh, let's see the, the, you started to get the AI power user again, um, that you're, you're, you're seeing more and more, um, usage and it's, you know, people are starting to define new roles out of that. Um, and, uh, oh, anyway, so other, other data out of it, I won't go through everything that it lists that you know, take away your joy of reading that. Um, <laughs> but what's, uh, what's come out of this is that, it, you know, it's especially, as I mentioned, when they removed the threshold, gave it to, to SMBs, I look at this as something that allows a small to mid-sized company to do a lot more than with the personnel that they have. Agreed. And uh, one of the one of the things about AI and the, the different forms that it's coming in, chat, GBT, co-pilot, so on, is, is how fast it's been proliferating through this, the sector and, and all of the different apps that we have. Uh, when I think back to when the internet first came out and how long that really took to get mass adoption or, or smartphones and how long, like we're, we're talking like, two fundamental technologies that have touched our lives in such uh, significant ways. And that took years. Some might even say decades for, for like the internet to really take off from the point of inception to the point where it's like in everything. AI, it's been, it's measured in months and there's not a single cloud service that I use in my day-to-day -day work life that does not have some AI infused that I can use. And the more I use it, the more you see some value, all the value that I want, no, but I still see value. So it's, it's nice that that barrier is removed, even whether it's for personal productivity or, or small to medium business, that, that makes great sense as well. But there's still some challenges there, aren't there? Like personal challenge, small, medium enterprise scale challenges. It's, there's still a lot of foundational core work that has to get done to make sure that data is grounded in what we think and know to be the, the right source of that information. Right. Well, that, that's, that's the thing. I, I think you just touched on it too. It's, it's, um, I, one important thing. I know that there's a lot of, uh, you know, AppPoint's probably still doing this. Um, I know, um, Rencore, Smarter Consulting, Focal Point, others that I talk to on a regular basis. They talk about, um, you know, co-pilot readiness. Um, they do advisory services, workshops and things around um, preparing for co-pilot. And a big part of that is understanding how the technology works and how it leverages the, the, the content that, that's there. Just like search in a, mm -hmm. a healthy search experience, you need to understand, okay, it's searching what? What is the data set behind it? Right. that it's searching through. How is that organized? How clean is that data? Am I going to find the result of what I'm looking for? Um, and, and so that's something with co-pilot readiness, you'd have to understand, people have to have a fundamental understanding of how it works and data that it's sourcing from, which is actually a great segue into the last um, article that I'll share here, which is the new agent capabilities in Copilot. Mm, yep. And uh, I'll talk about like when I heard the announcement around the ability to go and create, um, you know, Copilot per SharePoint site that you can go and have as part of a template um, automatically build a Copilot for the site that you're building and the data that you're populating with that. Yep. Like that is a great example so i know that and then maybe there will be a an aggregator co-pilot that goes and looks at um you know that data across the multiple sites you can have multiple co-pilots that access a site but you can have mm -hmm. one dedicated so if i if i need to do a really deep dive in and ask questions and get data around this project that you and i are working on we can go to that 
personalized copilot for that site for that team whatever that is that that with its data and get very specific it's not going to go and cloud it with data points metrics from other projects it'll be right the, right the and so that is i was having a conversation with somebody um uh, a couple of weeks back about how i started in the uh, uh you know the the data warehousing world yep the I, whole concept of going working for the phone company and building data marts so taking from all of this the thousands of servers across multiple locations and this user group inside the phone company wanted this slice of data so we'd go and pull data from these various sources on a regular basis which was excruciating um mm -hmm. pre, pre cloud and pre internet and to move all that data um do joins add it together and then off of that super subset of that build reports and dashboards and everything off and so it would be you know highly performant could we connect a dashboard to the multiple locations sure. yes and it'd be painfully slow it would get wrong data it wouldn't be able to connect the, the data points that they wanted so we would do that that model that's essentially what we've we're working our way back towards yep. and all in the cloud and built in seconds yes it's it's great that copilot can extend its tentacles out into the, all those different areas but there's something to be said for a more bespoke or curtailed experience where if if a business user maybe they're doing procurement or project work like you mentioned in your example and you go to that procurement or project site and you put a co-pilot on across all of their different document libraries and it can interrogate the results and it is a trustworthy site it is and in a user experience that is not overwhelming the user and now you've just added incremental value but you're still tapping into uh, all of that investment that you're making and i like that that sounds like a really good step forward without having to go necessarily all in when an organization may not no organization can go all in on one day maybe microsoft can but i i don't think uh people who are paid for these things would ever entertain something like that especially if they're in a highly compliant uh, organization and so there's a way where you can uh, meter out or, or measure out where the the copilot goes so if agent focus framework deliver it out small scale large scale it doesn't really matter but your your tailored experiences for the pilots and the ones that real information workers that can get the the full benefit out of the the M365 Copilot license. Well, then, sure, put them in that that right grouping. So, that that that's a very sound approach for organizations to have a you know AI first type of or a cloud and a cloud first type of approach to this rollout. Not all or nothing, but the the right AI tool and form factor for the right users and the right business need. I think the next step beyond and, and I've got on the screen here the team Copilot and talking about you know, its capabilities basically can go and facilitate meetings and follow, be your project manager, following up on tasks and has awareness of all those different pieces. It, it actually just makes me think following on what you just said is that I, I, I agree because everything is named Copilot now, or everything has a Copilot, like all these different yeah. things. And you think, well, what a hot mess of different things. I'm already, people are still struggling with how many teams and channels that they have access to. Yeah. Um, you know, all of the workspaces and the groups and the sites and all of that. Uh, but if you, if, if, so the first step is to enable the capability within the individual nodes, if you will, the next step, and maybe over the next year or two will be the aggregation, the, uh, uh, across those, the integration across those various things. I mean, I think of something like this, like this team co-pilot being able to go in and be, become like the automated project management organization across all the various activities so that it relieves the PM of doing the worst part of a project manager right, job, right, which right. is chasing people for updates on tasks. And if the system's <laughs> able to go and track all of that and dynamically, automatically make those updates based on the activities and prompts to the to that that user, 
we're going to be able to track again i put the pm hat on you'll yep. be able to track changes and roll with those changes and better understand the impact of those changes you're going to start to do well if i do this or if i'm delayed on this what will happen you're going to be able to natural language ask those kinds of questions how does this impact the tasks that are out there what are the still the outstanding tasks to complete this phase which is due on friday who do i need to go and harass who looks like they're behind on the in these areas much more interactive and that's just one area but it benefits from one having a co-pilot having that the, mm -hmm. the bot the agent whatever in each of those locations and then aggregating the data uh, and taking action around those things but it's interesting in that example that you 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 provide uh, it's it, it reminds me of uh, some of the fears that people expressed when Copilot came out, saying like, "Well, people are going to lose their jobs." No, it's like people are not going to lose their jobs. Um, someone is still going to have to figure out a, a mechanism to implement all of these complex business rules. Uh, Copilot is going to be smart, but it's not going to be that smart to to figure out all those those ins and outs. So, someone like ourselves, who you know maybe yeah. we consult or help develop solutions for or applications and solutions for these types of things having a a, a a mechanism to translate business rules into ai actions or co-pilot agent actions are, are going to be the the next you know platform that a lot of us will be working in and so i, I think jobs are still safe that's for sure um it's but it, I, I suppose in some ways this is you know the similar Similar to the, the the promises made with the Power Platform, when uh, you know there's this massive developer shortage, and we're trying to get the tools in the hands of business uh, users to become business technologists, and they can go create their own applications and solutions. Well, th this could be a, another extension to that that type of thinking for those cases, and it's uh, adding. Uh, value and not necessarily replacing people, so they can work on you know higher value work That's you know and I, I, I and i agree with you norm uh, it, it it just it makes me think and i'll, I'll close down this as too as we uh wrap things up here but i I'm, i've said for years i said this with the move the shift towards the cloud i you know i, I it's very much true with power platform and mm -hmm. certainly from the governance standpoint but it, it's true with copilot is that I think an undervalued role out in the world um, right now is around that the BA, the business analyst. Yep. And as I find myself, I mean, like yourself, getting more back into the services side, the delivery side, um, doing advisory services and and you know consulting, um, partnering and consulting, and being you're starting to work on more and more projects with end user customers. Um, it's I'm it takes me back to my roots where I started my tech career as a business analyst. I'm going in and being the person who understands the business side, the business, uh, uh, the business rules, the requirements, the, you know, the desired outcomes for the business, yes. but then also on the technology side understands that and then translating between the two. And there is a, you know, a huge demand for people that have that skill today yes yes indeed uh, agreed so yeah I, I i think that's there's going to be a lot of opportunity going forward for people at this skill yeah so well it, it's been uh, uh always an interesting conversation we always have great discussions and and, and if folks are wondering whenever um norm and i meet up at a conference or something we're like do we talk like getting these conversations like yeah every single time <laughs> <laughs> We go in depth on something like, what did you see? What did you hear? So, yes, yeah. Norm is one of my go-to people, especially around insights automation stuff. So am I going to see you at the Power Platform Conference in September? Are you going I, I, I will be, I will be attending in some form or fashion. Uh, I, yeah. I'm sad to say I did not get selected to speak, but uh, these things happen in life and uh, I will be there. It's uh I will be One there as well. Days. So we'll we'll do some photos. So folks, if you're uh, if you happen to be there in in September and come find Norm and I and tell us how much how great of a service that we have provided with these 
<laughs> we don't want negative uh, uh, information. We all we want is praise and adulation. Yes, looking forward to it, my friend. Well, it's great talking to you. Likewise. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcast, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.